Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indusor Education. Um, today we will talk about another form of energy, heat, which is basically uh, inner or internal energy um, of the object. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens. It's presented on unisor.com. I do suggest you, by the way, to watch this lecture from the website uh, rather than uh, from YouTube or somewhere else where you found it, because the website contains very detailed notes for each lecture. Uh, plus, it's presented in a logical sequence of other lectures, so you will see where exactly this lecture is relative to the other um, other ones. And uh, for those who would like to be challenged, there are exams for many uh, parts of this uh, course. Um, also, on the same website, unizor.com, you have a prerequisite course, which is Math for Teens. Um, I, I do consider um, mathematics as very important to be um, studied uh, before you study physics, because physics actually is using a lot of math, especially something like vector algebra, algebra and, uh, and calculus. All right, so, um, back to heat. Now, this is the second part of the energy uh, partition, if you wish, uh, of um, this course. The first uh, part was about mechanical energy, kinetic energy, potential energy. Now this is the second part which is related to heat, which is internal energy of the objects. And before going into um, discussion about heat um, uh, as a form of energy, I, I would like actually to uh, to spend some time to discuss what exactly our objects or substances we are dealing with uh, consist of. Primarily molecules and what are they doing inside our objects. It's very important to understand the nature of the heat. So, molecules. Um, let me start with a very simple um, object like a drop of water for instance. So you have a drop of water so I will do, I will split it in half, and I will have basically half of, of that drop. Then I will take the half of this drop, I will split it in half as well. I will have a quarter. Now, if I will continue this process uh, long enough, I will come to a point when the quantity of water I have, it's still water, but I cannot really split it in, in halves, so each half would also be water. Now, this is the smallest part of the substance, in this case substance is, is water, is the smallest part which basically retains all the properties of the big one. The big one was the drop of water, and this is, a, well, you can say it's a drop of water. Basically, it's a molecule. That's what the molecule actually is. By definition, the molecule is the smallest part of any um, object or a substance which retains the physical quality of the big one. If you will split it even further, you will not get water anymore. Now, we all know, for instance, the water contains two atoms of uh, hydrogen and one atom of uh, oxygen. Now, I do not talk about atoms right now, we will talk about this later on, but in any case, if you split this molecule somehow, you will get basically this picture. This is hydrogen atom, this is hydrogen atom, and this is the oxygen. So, this is basically inner structure of the molecule, but we are not talking about this right now. We are talking about molecule as the smallest part which retains the qualities of the water. Okay, so we know what the molecule is. By definition, the smallest part of the sub substance or object which retains the qualities. Now, what are these molecules do? Uh, what are they doing inside this object? Well, it depends. In certain cases, molecules are really attached to each, to, to, to each other into some kind of orderly structure and rigid structure. For instance, if you will take a look at the molecules inside 
um, some metal, for instance, if you go inside of iron or steel or something, steel actually is an alloy, but no matter what, it still has this crystalline structure inside, and all the molecules are very tightly um, attached to each other. They're not really significantly moving against each other. What they are doing is they are actually oscillating. So consider the same picture, but you have springs here. So that's how the molecules are arranged in some cases. Now, what actually happens in this case? We have um, the general shape of an object which contains these type of small molecules and these types of uh, connections between them. The general shape is always retained. So if you will put it in a gravitational field, for instance, the piece of iron will be still a piece of iron. If you will put it in space, where, where there are no gravitational uh, forces, it will still be the same piece of iron. So this is kind of a state of the matter uh, which we are called solid. So the solid objects are those objects where the molecules are uh, only vibrating around their places, but their places are the, the middle point of their vibrations still the same and it's fixed. Now, there are some other cases. The cases when the molecules are attached to each other, but not as rigidly as in this particular case. They are not just vibrating, they can actually move around each other, but not far away. Um, the model which I can envision right now is, let's consider the model, the molecules are um, covered with some kind of a sticky subject, like, I don't know, strawberry jam, all right? So these molecules are really like little balls with a strawberry jam around them. They are sticking together, actually, but not very hard. I mean, you can really shape them. If you will put them into, let's say, some kind of a vessel or reservoir, and you have a gravitational field, for instance, they will all go down, but they will still stick to each other. But if you will change the shape to this one, they will be in a different shape, and they will still stick to each other. So these are liquids. So the, the liquid is a different state of the matter. Solid, solid, and liquid. Now, if you will put it in, uh, let's say, a space without any gravitational field, it will still stick together, right? But there are no forces which are pulling them into one particular side. So in, in, in most of the cases, they will, uh, they will just form some kind of a sphere because they are still sticking to each other, but there are no outside forces, so, so they will make a sphere. And there are different, actually, explanations of why this is sphere, we will, which we might address in, in the future when we will talk about properties of liquids, about surface tension, etc. But anyway, these are still sticking together but not as hard as in this particular case. Finally, there is another state of the matter, which we are, to we, 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 which we are talking about as gas. Now, gas is when basically there is no um, strawberry jam. So these are individual um, molecules which are not really very uh, much connected to each other and whenever you have certain space available for them, they will start moving in all the different directions and they will fill up the whole space. So the gas is something which has the weakest linked w links w between the molecules and the fact that they are moving uh, really makes it to take the whole volume available for it. So, solids liquids and gas are three main states of the matter. I mean, there are some others like plasma, for instance, we are not talking about this. The major, three major states uh, for our purpose are solids, 
um, liquids and, and, and gas. Now, in all three cases, molecules are not standing still. They're still moving within certain limits. This one, for the solid, they're just moving around their point of equilibrium, like on the springs. Now, in this case, these are moving without actually losing the contact. So, one particular um, ball uh, covered with a strawberry jam can move to another one. It will still be part of the whole liquid, the whole of the, the, the body of the substance. And if there is some kind of a gravitational field, it will still go down and fill up this particular um, vessel. And finally, the gases. The gases are always the weakest connection among themselves, and they're always taking the whole space. And obviously, they are chaotically, completely chaotically moving, much more chaotically, obviously, than liquids, and liquids are much more chaotically moving than the structure of the solids. By the way, in case of solids, you are not necessarily having this kind of a structured um, um, uh, order of, of, of the molecules. So it's not necessarily um, of this kind. It can be, for instance, something like this. Um, let's talk about the same kind of uh, model. So you have um, the balls covered, not in the strawberry jam, but in glue, basically. And the glue is basically hardened. So you don't have really a structured, symmetrical um, uh, structure uh, like, like this one, but you still have a, a solid shape. They're still moving against each other, and maybe even moving a little bit if glue is not really completely hardened. But still, the general shape is preserved for these solids. And the difference between this structured order and non-structured order of the solids is in terminology. These ones are called crystals or crystalline type and um, the ones which do not have such an orderly um, structure is called amorphous. Okay, these are just terminology. Everything is, by the way, on the internet in the notes for this particular lecture. All right, so we have covered this type of things. What's next? Um, heat. Okay, now we are ready to talk about heat. What is heat? Okay, the heat is intensity of the moving of the molecules inside the body. So whenever you are heating up, for instance, um, this solid, these molecules are shaking much harder. They're still maintaining their neutral position, but the amplitude is increasing. Uh, you don't see it, obviously, because it, we, we are seeing on a micro level, and this is on the level of uh, um, mo molecules, which we need special instruments to do it. But that's what, what happens. In case of liquid, again, this strawberry jam is, is, is basically trying to keep them together, but they're still moving much more intensely as the heat coming. And finally, the gas, it's chaotic movement of all the molecules within the volume, and they're moving with, um, uh, my, they're moving much faster. So, the intensity of the moving of the molecules, intensity of the molecular uh, movements inside the object or inside the substance, is actually the uh, manifestation of heat, and that's what we call heat. Now, um, these molecules are uh, shaking or, or moving around, etc. So. Whenever we touch something which is hot, it means the molecules inside of that body are moving very, very fast. And the molecules inside our finger, for instance, are moving much slower. And then when you touch them, what happens? Well, if you just take two, for instance, different um, volume of gases, in one uh, volume you have gases which are moving very, very fast, the molecules are moving very fast, and another uh, slow, and then you open uh, the border between them. What happens? Well, those which are fast start moving towards those which are slow. They're trying to mix together, and gradually their moving becomes 
uh, uniform, re relatively uniform, because those which are faster will start hitting those which are uh, slower and um, uh, increase their speed correspondingly. And eventually the, uh, the distribution of these speeds will more or less even out. So that's exactly what happens when you are touching something. The molecules which are moving very fast are touching on the border the molecules which are moving slow and these molecules which are slow becomes faster so that's how we are feeling that something is is happening on this um, border between uh, between our finger and and the hot surface and eventually these molecules which are moving very fast uh, coming through the finger and they are um, uh, hitting the receptors the nerves etc etc and the signal goes to the to the brain and that's we feel actually that this is hot and this is cold or something like this now if it's cold it's the other way around obviously uh, if you're touching the cold thing then our finger has faster molecules and they are touching those which are slower so the heat actually goes two birds uh, the slower ones um, decreasing the uh, the uh, speed of the molecules inside the fingers and again we are feeling some difference all right so this is basically the most important part of this lecture heat is a, a, an intensity of the molecular movement so it's like a definition basically if you wish that's what i wanted to make sure you all understand so you can talk about kinetic energy for instance of individual um, molecules obviously different molecules have different kinetic energy but since they're all hitting each other eventually it's more or less um, evenly spreading within the object so if you for instance start hitting uh, a metal rod on, on one end the the fast molecules will hit the the slow ones making them moving faster and they uh, move it uh, they transfer this movement this energy further and further even if you consider this relatively rigid um, uh, structure of the solid if you start shaking one particular molecule it will eventually shake the whole system because the movement is transferred from one spring to another from one connection to another so eventually the the temp the, well i don't want to say the term temperature i will still try to determine it a little later but anyway the heat is uh, dissipating okay what's next uh, okay now and we were talking about how energy is transform uh, is, is transferring from one part of the object to another um, okay now what happens for instance with um, uh, different states of the matter if we will start heating for instance the solid what happens well these molecules are shaking more and more intensely right and um, eventually this shaking can actually destroy this nice structure I mean if heat is really very very intense then the shaking of these molecules can actually break the links and these links become uh, they, they still exist the attraction still exists between the molecules but you're ripping them up all the time and new ones are actually formed so this is melting so when you heat the steel for instance it will melt into liquid now what happens with the liquid for instance if you will warm it up well again these molecules start moving faster and faster these are basically the balls as i was saying covered with uh, strawberry jam but if they're moving very very fast some of them can actually break this link between them this strawberry jam is sticky but not sticky enough and they will start evaporating and gradually this liquid can be transformed into the gas so that's how um, different states of the matter are transforming one to another uh, as we are heating the objects and there is obviously the re reverse if you start freezing the gas for instance you can freeze the helium um, into liquid 
calcium and then the liquid um, for instance the water can be frozen into ice by the way ice also has this crystalline structure so you have um, transformed um, an, a substance or an object from one state of the matter to another by using um, the, the heat by imp the, um, putting more heat or, uh, or getting heat out from the object so the transformation between the different states of the matter is important and it's related very much with the speed of the motion of the molecules which is actually a heat okay done that what else is important let's consider we applying heat to the same steel road which we were doing this but not as much to melt it completely well just let's say from um, the room temperature to um, another I don't know like the temperature of the boiling water right what happens if I will take the steel rod from the room temperature and put it into hot water well uh, let me tell you a practical example um, if you have a can which you have to open by uh, unscrewing it what what happens I mean it's really very difficult but uh, especially if you took it from the refrigerator right so you have a glass can with uh, let's say pickles and you have this lid which uh, screwed on and you're trying to unscrew it and it doesn't really happen with bare hands because it's really hard so you put it under hot water only the lid all right and then all of a sudden it's much easier to open it why Okay, so what happens is the following. Again, let's go into the internal structure. You have the structure, and then you start uh, shaking these molecules around. Now, whenever you're shaking them, they are a little bit spreading apart. So the size of the object is slightly increasing with the heat. I mean, different um, substances are increasing in, in size differently by different percentage or different degree or whatever else. For instance, glass is really kind of difficult to increase in size by, 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 by heating it up. But the metals, for instance, are really increasing in size noticeably. Now, how can we, for instance, notice that? Now, if you, um, um, if you know, whenever you're having the rails, so there is one rail, they put and then another rail, they have a little gap in between why because in hot weather the rails expand so if you will put it um, completely touching to each other they will bend and we don't want bent rails right so this is g just an example of really practical case when things do expand with the heating okay they change size so usually usually not always but usually with the temperature increasing the geometrical size of the object is increasing and decreasing uh, in, in an opposite direction there is actually one very interesting um, well you can call it exception from the rule but this exception is so important that the whole life on earth actually depends on it so let's consider the water water is a very special liquid by the way so let's consider the water and we are gradually bringing down its temperature now um, as you bring down the temperature from let's say a room temperature um, I'll use the Celsius for instance 20 degrees Celsius you bring it down to 4 uh, degrees Celsius so what happens well it probably decrease in the volume just a little bit but then if you freeze it a little bit further it actually increases the volume so this is something um, which is the minimum I would say um, and then whenever it's converted into the ice ice actually has a greater volume than the water at four degrees why is it important well if it has a greater volume and I don't know why I mean it's just that's how it is now if it has a greater volume it has less density so this is more dense than this and what happens 
and w when the lake for instance is covered with ice ice is on the top because it's less dense than the water underneath now if it was the other way around if the temperature as the temperature goes down the volume goes down 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 and which means that the density goes up and up and up with the same mass right then the the, the ice as soon as it forms it will go down to the bottom and then again and again until the whole lake would be basically completely frozen and if it's frozen then no no fish there etc etc right so this preserves actually the life in the water um during the winter time when the when 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 the ice is actually formed on the water okay so this is a very important thing size changes with the temperature now this actually opens the door for us to use this change of the size as the measurement of the heat which is inside this particular um, uh, object or, or substance how can we do it well actually it's kind of, sim kind of a simple thing so now we're talking about thermometer which helps us to measure the temperature now what is temperature well, temperature is actually, in, in plain words, it's intensity of the movement. So we do need this, we, we rarely need uh, the entire amount of energy in the object. I mean, maybe we do, but in most cases we are not interested in this. We are just interested is, what, what we are interested in is how hot this object is if I will touch it, right? So what does it mean it means I have to really measure the intensity of the movement of the molecules of this okay what is the intensity of the movement of the molecules for instance you ha can measure uh, the mass and the speed and that's why kinetic energy of every molecule of this object then you add them up divide by the number of molecules and you have an average um, amount of energy kinetic energy per molecule that's actually a good measurement of intensity of the movement right of the temperature the average amount of kinetic energy per molecule is a good measure the problem is we can't measure it obviously what we can measure is something a little bit simpler um, which gives us basically a relative um, understanding uh, of, of, of how intense the movement of these um, uh, molecules actually is. Let's take, for instance, a classic thermometer, which has uh, some kind of a reservoir with, um, let's say, mercury. Mercury, you know, quicksilver. And this is the level. Um, of the mark of the mercury and this is a relatively thin tube now why is it thin very important if I will increase the temperature of the mercury mercury is liquid liquid will expand and if this is a thin tube then it will expand and on, on a relatively noticeable length the thinner the tube is the same expansion of this mass would actually take it higher, right? So that's very important um, because if you don't have this, for instance, if, if, if you have very, like a, a glass, all right, and you have this mercury. Now, obviously, if you will heat it up, it will increase uh, the level because the volume will increase, but very, very tiny increase. But if you have a, a thin tube here, it will increase much more noticeably. Okay, so this is a good uh, instrument to measure the temperature of the mercury inside. So, for instance, we just put it in, uh, on the table and we, we have some kind of a mark, obviously, on, the, on, the, on this tube. And we know it goes up or down, which means the temperature is higher or lower. How can I measure temperature of something else, not this particular thing? Well, you remember that whenever you are touching something, the uh, molecules which are faster 
force the molecules which are slower to move faster. Well, then it depends actually which body is more massive. Obviously, if, if you have a very small body and a very big body, then whatever is happening in the big body would be the most important part and the average after you will add this small uh, attachment. So if, if you have a, a big and this is the heart and the tiny which is cold what happens well if you touch them um, then this cold will become almost as hot as this one I mean there is something which is maybe lowering down the temperature of this but very very insignificantly so considering this is the big body and this is a small one the uh, resulting temperature of this thing would be practically the same as this one so I will take this device which is very small one actually and I will touch with this device a big one let's say I would like to measure the temperature of the body so I have this thing thermometer to to put it into mouth or, or under arm or whatever and eventually the temperature of the body will influence this particular uh, thermometer to have the same temperature and then I can again look at the level of this um, mercury in the tube to find exactly the, what, what exactly the, the temperature is so all I need right now is to quantify the whole thing okay now how can I quantify it well first of all we have to find some base points now in the cell zone system of uh, measuring the, the temperature the two most important points are the point of freezing um, when the ice actually is converting into water or water into ice the melting ice kind of a temperature it's by definition a zero degree of Celsius now another base point is boiling water which is by definition a hundred Celsius so all they did is okay let's consider this is zero this is 100 divided in 100 little pieces and we will have degrees so the temperature is measured in degrees of Celsius now obviously each degree can be broken down into tens of degree or whatever now if the temperature goes down or the temperature goes up whatever it is doesn't really matter we have the whole scale of temperatures now this is basically um, the temperature the, the way how to measure temperature it's a uh, all over across the world except United States in United States well and its territories um, the measurement is in degrees of Fahrenheit um, now the Fahrenheit also has two main points 0 and 100 now 100 is almost temperature of the body well at the time when it was invented they considered the temperature of the body to be a hundred degrees of Fahrenheit and then they had some kind of a solution some some kind of a salt I don't even remember which one the point of freezing of that solution it's not water some kind of a solution chemical solution was taken as the zero point and again they did exactly the same thing they divided the scale um, into hundreds of degrees etc uh, obviously it's a different scale I mean different things were taken as the basis and the, the one degree in Fahrenheit is not exactly the same as this one but there is a very simple formula um, if you subtract 32 from Fahrenheit and multiply by 5 nines you will get Celsius Celsius so that's how it's converted now in which case 0 Celsius is basically 32 Fahrenheit and finally there is a, another uh, measurement style measurement uh, scale uh, it's Kelvin degrees of Kelvin now degrees of Kelvin are um, uh, very much like uh, Celsius in what is a degree so the size of one degree is exactly the same as in Celsius but the zero point is different now the zero point in Kelvin is the absolute zero now what is absolute zero well, if you go out to space, there are no stars in, in the vicinity. Nobody actually gives you any source of energy. Well, the temperature over there is called the absolute zero. And absolute zero 
in Kelvin is minus 273.15 degree of Celsius. So that's the conversion basically. So you have to add to Kelvin, you have to add 273.15 to get into Celsius. So these are three different scales. Now the Kelvin is used in scientific uh, research um, because the Kelvin degrees are very nicely um, uh, um, accommodated in, in formulas of physics and thermodynamics, etc., which we will talk about. Um, now the Celsius is again um, across all the uh, countries except the United States, and the United States is using Fahrenheit. Um, that's basically all I wanted to talk about. This is an introductory into what actually heat as energy is. Um, there are no formulas, as you see, for a change. Usually I have some formulas around. Not this time. Well, no, there is one formula. Yeah, this one. Anyway, um, so this is basically an introductory into uh, heat as the form of energy. Uh, I do suggest you to go to this website and read the notes for this lecture. Um, it's kind of a also um, relatively concise explanation of the same topics and it's very important to know exactly what we mean when we're talking about heat as energy, when we're talking about tem temperature as basically intensity of the movement of the molecules, etc. And again, everything depends on molecular movement as the source of this heat energy. It's internal energy which is um, uh, concentrated inside the object or substance. That's it. Thanks very much and good luck.